Inversions occur when a segment of a chromosome is removed, turned 180 degrees, and reinserted back into the chromosome. For example, here we have an individual with these two chromosomes. Where is our inversion? We can see that chromosome 2 has undergone a pericentric inversion when compared with chromosome 1. We know this because the chromosome was broken at two separate points on both sides of the centromere. The portion was rotated 180 degrees and reinserted. What effect will this have on meiosis? Well, the goal of meiosis is to maximize the pairing of homologs. In a perfect world, when our two chromosomes pair up, the alike chromosomal segments and genes would all align correctly. However, if we look at our two chromosomes above, we notice that our segments don't quite match up. In order to maximize pairing, a structure called an inversion loop is formed. Remember, in meiosis 1, sister chromatids have not yet separated, so we have two chromatids per each chromosome coming into play. Crossing over occurs when homologous chromosomes pair up with each other and exchange genetic material. Duplications and deletions result when crossing over occurs in inversion loops. When our gametes do not contain all the gene categories from the original chromosome, we say that they are no longer viable. Let's follow our loops to see what type of gametes will result from individual one sister chromatids. Let's think of our diagram as four different routes that four different school buses take to pick up kids. These buses must pick up kids from grades 1 to 7. Following the route for chromatid number 1, we will pick up an M, L, I, centromere, J, K, H, G. Let's look at our second chromatid. Following our route, we will pick up M, L, I, centromere, J, and here is where things get a bit different. This route can sometimes be dangerous in the rain, meaning that the bus driver has to turn onto a different road fast, missing certain houses and going to ones that they don't usually pick up on the path. Crossing over can cause something like this to occur. We will jump down to road number 4. Following this new track, we pick up K and then loop back to L and M. For route 3 on our third chromatid, we will first pick up M, L, K, J, centromere, I, H, G. Notice that we haven't traveled to a couple of houses on some of our routes. Our fourth bus driver will ensure that every portion left out so far is included. We pick up G, H, K, and then switch roads and pick up J, centromere, I, looping back down to H and G. Looking at the gametes we created, chromatid or routes 1 and 3 have children from each of the 7 grades or all 7 gene types, meaning the gametes are viable. However, chromatid 2 and 4 left out some of the grades or genes, so they are not viable. Let's look at individual 2's chromosomes. There are no inversions here, so these are able to pair up well during meiosis without the use of an inversion loop. Starting with the top chromosome, we have MLI centromere JKHG. Starting at chromatid 2, we have MLI centromere J, and we are forced to cross downwards to road number 3. Following the route, we get KHG. Following path number 3, we get MLI centromere J, and we have a crossover. We must cross to path 2, giving us KHG. Finally, for our fourth chromatid, we get MLI centromere JKHG with no crossovers. All of these gamete types will be viable as they include the children from each of the seven grades or all gene types. Individual 2 has greater fitness than individual 1 because individual 1 is heterozygous for inversions. These types tend not to survive and produce as many offspring, meaning it will be selected against in the wild. Remember, only half of individual 1's gametes were viable. Individual 2 was homozygous for normal chromosomes and all of its gametes were viable.